Jack, I want to ask you because um, Nashville, I had one of our members ask today about like what's the new hot spots, what's going on there. If new restaurants open in Nashville or what's happening there in the corners? I don't know if there's hot new restaurants opening in Nashville, but I've seen new restaurants open and I saw them early open up fairly early on in this pandemic and they seem to actually at the time get disproportionately high traffic because I think people felt like if you're a newer place, you're more likely to be following standards. Wow. Now it's been a while, and I, it seems like traffic's returned to the places where, the, where it's always been, as long as you're not, you know, a sit-down restaurant or something. But um, I was in, uh, it's it's very interesting just how different it is from city to city. I was in Asheville um, the last couple of days, North Carolina, and there it's all about wearing masks, right? It's like super, super uh, mask progressive, and one place had a great uh, banner with a big slogan on the front, on, on the front said no mask on your face big disgrace spreading your germs all over the place but that was, <laughs> was, was sort of fun uh, in nashville people wear masks too but it's not uh super in your face you know this is the last one of this series that we did which is about you know the best practices for COVID 19 and what we look for for the future and it was for us to bridge the gap between what's happening tomorrow where are we going to be where are we now um, to where we're going to be going. And so it's, it's been really, I think it's awesome. I think everybody that we've had on, both members and sponsors, have added so much to, you know, to, to help all of us that were sitting in this, you know, storm to find ways to use good information and make something really work that's going to help the brands and the teams that you guys all represent. So that's been awesome. Uh, just a quick one to say. So the next one in two weeks is going to start what we look at is really uh, going more into innovation. Uh, we feel like, and everybody, all the members that I've talked to um, and sponsors uh, have confirmed that right now, everybody who sat back, cutting back menus, you know, really like hunkered down and said, we're going to do this for a while, have finally said, all right, now we've got to start innovating. We've got to start bringing the menu back a little bit. Steven, I know you'll give us some stats on that and where you guys were and are right now and, uh, and Jeff as well. And so I think right now is a perfect timing for us to shift gears, you know, and now hit into second or third year and start talking about innovation. What does it look like again with an, an undecided future as to when, I mean, I think we all know that we're going to get back to normal at some point in time, but there's a big question on when it is. So we're going to start working a, little, a lot more with uh, major cities around the country and major chefs and other people um, and relying more on you, Jack, you know, to bring in information about what's happening in that world as well. So then we really start looking at um, when you're starting innovation, you know, how far do you go? I mean, how, you know, what, what kind of pipeline do you want to fill? How far down the road do you want to do it? Um, uh, Steven, I know you're going to have some great information on uh, the lack of doing research like you used to do, right? So it's not going to be the same where you're researching things to death and you have six to six months to a year. So I'm really anxious about all this information today. And I think it's a great segue into what we're going to be doing here um, starting on the 16th of September. We have uh, Edward Lee from uh, Louisville because we were doing a, um, an immersion, ICCA immersion in Louisville. So we're going to have him come in and talk about actually using bourbon as an ingredient and then we have some bourbon experts coming on to talk about the beverage side of that industry, but also just, you know, to look at things. Okay. When we start moving forward, what do we do? I read some articles today about bourbon because I'm starting to get into that to get ready for this one in two weeks. And I'm blown away at the numbers of what's happened. Not so much even during this COVID situation, but in the couple of years leading up to it and uh, how much it's grown. So I think we're going to pick topics that are really something that, I think all of our members are going to look at and say, hey, we've got to start looking at this seriously if we haven't already and what we're going to do. So um, starting with introductions. So obviously we have Jack Lee. You know, he is uh, with Data Essential and we're so happy you're back with us today and I love the shirt. OK, the Haiku Masters got a great shirt on today. Um, we've got uh, Jeff Mann. He's a vice president of culinary for Alamo Draft House and Cinema. Uh, Jeff's been around with us for a long time. He was with Magianos for many years with Keith and a member for ICCA for many years. And now he's on the board and a very big part of what we're doing with GCIA. And then we've got Stephen, Stephen Bogarelli. Stephen's a culinary, uh, chief culinary officer for Applebee's Grill and Bar. Of course, he's been with us for a long time as well with Chili's for many years and actively involved on the board uh, of ICCA. So we're really happy that you guys are with us today. Uh, and I look forward to 
the conversation we're going to have. So, Stephen, why don't we start with you? You know, let's kind of go through, you know, a little bit of where you guys started during this, but most importantly, where you are today and where you're going with innovation in the future. Sure. Well, as most of you guys are aware, and I'm sure all are in the same boat, when, the, when this hit in March, we shut down, right? We uh, uh, stopped all testing, stopped all innovation. Uh, restaurants were closed. Uh, menu was reduced down to 39 menu items from 190, which is a good thing. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was dramatic and it was impactful and it was hurtful. I mean, we were down 80% in sales, right? I mean, I'm sure you all felt the same thing. And since then, we have um, slowly progressed and, 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 and offered different platforms and continued expanding our menu. Uh, we went in stages so that our franchisees and supply chain, more importantly, uh, was the big concern about expanding the menu. Could we get the chicken and the beef and the ribs because our, uh, our suppliers and our partners there were facing COVID issues as well, right? So they were losing employees and, and having to shut down. So as the largest casual dining restaurant in uh, the U.S., we really were forced to make some decisions based on what we could get and what we couldn't get. Uh, but, you know, things have changed. Beef prices have come down, which is fantastic. Ribs are still an issue. Chicken still is temperamental because there's a lot of people wanting to buy it. And they're still having issues at chicken plants as well, as I'm sure you all are aware. So we've slowly uh, increased the menu. As of November, we're going to be on one menu, which is fantastic. Um, for the entire system, which is 1,600 plus restaurants. And uh, we feel confident about that menu. We've right-sized it and taken this opportunity to make sure that it's appropriate for not only our guests, but for operations. It's taken a while. We're a franchisee system. So it's a lot of politics back and forth to approve, disapprove, to align on what's appropriate on the menu, as you guys could aware, there's different regions and we're all over the US. So some people in the Northeast sell certain items and some people in the Southwest don't. So it's this negotiating back and forth. And what this pandemic has allowed us to do is really come together as one system to say, this is what we need to focus on. This is what's appropriate for the guest. And here's where we're going to move in the future. In fact, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to have that conversation with all of our franchisees to align on another menu strategy that was different prior uh, to make sure that uh, what we have in restaurant is exactly what we need to have from a guest perception. So we've taken advantage of the situation, even though it's hurt us, obviously going through but this business is surprising me. Uh, again, uh, in, it's just amazing how well our brand has done. Uh, uh, Off-premise has, you know, huge, uh, significant increases from where it was prior. And uh, it continues to grow. And given the fact that we only have 50% uh, capacity in all restaurants. Even if, even if the state said you could have 75%, we don't have the capacity to do that because you have to be six feet apart. So maximum 50% in every restaurant. Now, what we have allowed is outdoor dining and our franchisees have taken advantage of this in spectacular formation. It's amazing what they have done. Uh, I see pictures all the time, every day on outdoor dining and how they've embraced it and how they have executed it. Um, we also, uh, when we reopened, uh, were mandated uh, system-wide that everyone follow the same safety rules. So everyone, all servers have to wear masks, all guests have to wear masks in restaurants until they're actually eating. Uh, we're six feet apart. We have two safety specialists on staff all at all times. So they're constantly disinfecting bathrooms, surfaces, tables, door handles, 
that guests are seeing this. And we've taken a survey recently on how the guests feel safe-wise, and it, we're off the charts. They're like, wow, I didn't expect this to happen. Uh, now, we still have some incidents, right? Like you can't wait in the waiting room. You have to wait outside or in the car. And some people don't understand that. But as, uh, as a whole, they get it. They understand it. They appreciate it. We are doing more off-premise to um, our, our uh, 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 I'm sorry, our older folks, our uh, baby boomers, because they're not feeling safe coming in the restaurant, which makes sense, right? They're the older population. Um, so they're really, really taking advantage of the to-go and off-premise uh, piece of the business. Uh, but our millennials and, and, and Gen Z are coming in like crazy. In fact, we're, we're doing late night programs now with our cocktail program, and they're just looking for excuses to kind of get out uh, and uh, get back to some normalcy, which is really encouraging. So I'm very positive and I'm very hopeful for the future. We will get through this and we'll, we'll go through it, um, you know, but we've learned. And I think uh, there's some advantages that have taken place. And again, I said QR codes, right? Uh, we're using those. It doesn't work for boomers because they're not as tech savvy, right? <laughs> They're, they're, they're not embracing it. They want the paper menus, which are great. We use those, uh, and we will continue to use those. They're very costly. Um, we are going to roll out a laminated version of a menu, which can be disinfected. Um, but really what impresses me is that we're able to embrace this QR code menu, and people are forced to do it. So, you know, it, it was going to take us a while to transition, and I think what's great about this is, is it's happened, right? There's no choice. And uh, that's exciting because it really was going to take us a while to integrate into the system. But now we have it in place and it's easier for our franchisees. Think about the printing costs alone on menus. If you could do this on your phone and the younger generation wants to do it on their phone and wants to pay on their phone. So it's just, like I said, there's some advantages of this. There's some disadvantages of it, sales being a disadvantage. But, you know, we're taking advantage of what we can do, um, which has been fantastic. So I'm an optimistic, and I believe in what the future will be and very hopeful for uh, the future. And, and, and all of us, I think, will do well. It's the independents, unfortunately, that are taking the bigger hit. I feel bad for them. Um, but, uh, you know, for us, it's worked out well. We're back on TV, which is fantastic. Um, you know, value is a big deal for us. We're, we're that brand, right? We are always going to be the value brand. We're never going to be the high quality food brand. It's, it's all about value. We're not in the A and B sites like uh, I used to be with Chili's and other brands. We are in the smaller cities. So for us, uh, takeout and to-go is big and has been, and is increasing. Uh, and then, um, you know, just allowing our guests to dine indoors or outdoors is great. We don't have, there's, there's cities and um, counties out there that don't allow indoor dining. And so we've solved it with outdoor dining for the time being. And that's only gonna last for so long, right? Because in the Midwest and Northeast, it's gonna get cold and we're not gonna be able to do that. Here in California, we're facing the opposite issue because this week uh, we're supposed to hit record highs. This is the hot season for California, for those of you who don't know. And uh, like this Sunday, is supposed to be 107. So, uh, you know, what they have done in California is fantastic. Like in Pasadena, they've actually closed off streets to allow these restaurants to uh, overflow into the street. Uh, but when it's 107, you're not going to get people that come out, regardless of there's no humidity or not, because there is no humidity here versus other places I live. It doesn't matter. It's just too hot. So, um, you know, weather is a big influence on this, and we see it reflected in our daily sales. So hopefully, you know, things will start changing and uh, we'll get more indoor dining allowed, and that's happening. New Jersey and California and some counties are allowing indoor dining even if it's at 25% is a good thing. So, um, you know, given all of the circumstances that are happening, I'm very pleased uh, with what's happening in our restaurants and where we are today. 
Hey, uh, Stephen, there's a question that we got we had from um, uh, Greg Battaglia from Custom Foods of America. He wants to know what's your gut feeling on the 190 items you had on the menu before back to the normal world, whenever that is, what do you think the number will be? I, I honestly believe a hundred. Uh, we really, a lot of that was line extensions. And we also, because we're a franchise system, we have allowed over the years, our franchisees to one off things like, Oh, this is okay for this region. And that's okay for that region. Well, that really is difficult from a supply chain issue, right? So not only from an R and D and operations piece of it, which is separate, but just a logistical, um, you know, uh, supplier issue it's it's difficult because then you're splitting hairs and getting into different dcs and different regions and we've come a long way believe me in a very short time to agree that hey listen we need one menu this works for all of us uh we'll take into consideration everything that's happening and of course we'll look at sales and everything else uh, but I think we're taking advantage of the situation for sure and saying, hey, listen, let's not sell the one or two things that we sell a day uh, system wide. It could be different uh, based on region, but we're going to we're going to focus. Let's focus in on what we know we can deliver and deliver well. Right. Because the more menu items you have, the less you can focus in on. And what we do know is burgers and steaks and appetizers are big for us. And we need to focus in on those. And it's hard to do when you have 190 menu items. Yeah, it's actually an interesting thought, Stephen. So you launched with 39 items and you had a lot of your customers come back uh, to you right then. It almost opens the door for a new type of menu launch or LTO where you can announce like, hey, now we're bringing back this item, right? That you haven't been able to have in a while and sort of like relaunching stuff. Are you looking at doing any messaging like that as you get back, scale back to the 100, let's say? Oh, ab totally. I mean, uh, we will take advantage of the categories we know uh, are big for us and really market those. And if it's something that was popular uh, a couple of years ago or even longer, we'll definitely bring back. We've already started that. We started that last year and it's been great success for us. So, we will continue that. We will also to continue to uh, line extend, right? So boneless wings is our number one selling appetizer, which is not surprising. And we'll line extend that, right? We already have line extensions, but it, it wasn't necessarily um, the strategy as far as I'm concerned was not thought out very well to begin with when it became some certain line extensions. And as you guys know, it's hard to delete items. Anytime you delete an item, you get complaints and you get franchisees saying, no, no, no. Uh, so we're taking full advantage of this situation to right size, uh, to market appropriately and make sure we have the best products that our guests all over the United States will appreciate. Yeah, so it's actually interesting, you know, you, you mentioned delivery is a big part of the business now without getting into the specific numbers, you know, it, there was a time when delivery first got big that it, there was a question going around, do we create separate menus for delivery versus the on-premise stuff? And I think the industry sort of said, you know, delivery is going to be maybe 10, 15% of our business. So we'll just offer the same menu or at best we'll like nix some items like you can't have an ice cream sundae delivered. Now, if going forward, delivery might still be, let's say, 50% of your sales, would you make a special menu just for delivery that you cannot get in store where, you know, the item is made to travel, let's say? Well, that's a great question. And believe me, we've had many debates over this internally um, and externally. Uh, but what I can say is that our guests expect the same menu items regardless if it's delivery or in restaurant it makes no difference to them if it travels well they want it so it's up to us to figure out how to make it travel well and we've spent a tremendous amount of time and money on packaging to do that so that stuff does travel well now when you go online we will highlight things appropriately where the guest is not aware that these items do travel better than others. So those items will be highlighted more than the others, but we really have taken a great look and has spent a lot of time on 
on what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. And at the end of the day, the guest does not care. As far as the research I've seen, they want what's in restaurant. So if there's a destination draw in our restaurant that may not travel well, they, they want it, right? And I don't blame them. I would be the same way. And it's up to us to figure out how to do that. And we have and successfully have rolled out new packaging that does, for instance, French fries. We have a new, you know, a new package for French fries that holds it well. And then if we need to, we'll re-engineer the product. When well, we're in the process of looking at our fries again to look at the newest technology, because you guys know that changes all the time, to say, hey, is there, a, is there a better product out there that will hold temperature and crispness? And we were about to test a whole bunch of new products uh, before COVID hit, and unfortunately that, that stopped. But what I can tell you is that the guest doesn't care. They want what they want, and reducing the menu is only causing confusion because what they'll do is if they go on a DoorDash or a third-party site and they don't see what they want, they'll call the restaurant which causes another whole issue, right? So now you're off a third party onto actually the restaurant and it's complicated because if the phone keeps ringing, like it has been, you need a dedicated person. We have that now, but we didn't pre COVID. So, you know, there's a whole lot of intricacies that play into this. And um, I think we're forced to uh, become more technology savvy in the restaurants. I mean, if you do more than one, oh, I'm sorry, my dogs are barking. Yeah. Um, if you do more than one platform, it, it's hard. You need more than one tablet if you don't have the proper technology. So, yeah, it's it's a great point. And you know, um, if I just throw out one stat for everybody, we when we looked at delivery years ago, and we we've, we've looked at this more recently as well. The one thing that people say they want with packaging is ovenable packaging in delivered restaurant food. They want to be able to take the entire thing they get, the whole bag and all the stuff inside the bag and just put it inside their, you know, their oven at home and get the thing to the temperature that they wanted. So I actually think the future is going to look something like um, some signal goes out to the third party marketplace or delivery company or whoever's doing it. That signal goes into your smart oven at home, starts preheating the thing yeah. for you. So when the food gets there, you put it in and then a little chime goes off when it's at the temperature you wanted is probably what it looks like, but that ovenable packaging thing is something we should all be working on if we're, if we're not already. We, we have, we have that in our catering That's packaging. That's awesome. Hey, this is a good segue into Jeff because I was really kind of surprised when we talked yesterday about the fact that you guys were actually doing, you know, to go orders from your, you know, cinema, you know, draft houses uh, to start this off in Austin. So why don't you walk us through like, what happened in your world during this? Because, and again, your industry is probably one of the last, I would think, um, that really came to full opening, you know, really within the last week or so. Um, and, and so walk us through what's, what's happened in your world. Yeah, you know, ironically is uh, one of the big initiatives for 2020 uh, back in January was to launch uh, carry out third party delivery. Um, you know, it, what's interesting is being a full service restaurant and bar is that during the day part, you know, we only need about eight or nine guests in a theater uh, to break even. But, you know, you, you still have all that labor back there. So we're saying, okay, let's, let's look at different opportunities. We ran a small test at the end of 2019 and we ended up uh, doing a decent amount of carry out of one location with no advertising at all. So, you know, we were, we were talking about a 1% lift in food and beverage, uh, which we easily did uh, if we would have continued it in 2019. So the initiative was to roll it uh, in, you know, start to roll it out in 2020, then COVID hit. Uh, and the one location that we did it at, we kept open. Uh, and we were doing, we were doing carry out, we were doing curbside, you know, in addition to food, uh, you know, we were doing alcoholic kits and stuff like that. But what's unique about Alamo is being multifaceted. We, you, you know, Alamo as a, as a brand, uh, we, we've got a sister company called Mondo who does artwork and does other stuff, builds puzzles, does games. So all of a sudden we said, okay, let's, let's bring Mondo involved. So 
setting it up where well, we're selling puzzles, we we're selling kits in addition to food and beverage. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're definitely nowhere near where you want to be uh, at being fully open, but it proved to us that it was something that we could do. Uh, and ironically, we started a ghost kitchen uh, as well uh, during COVID. So focusing on that, in addition, we had talked about this back in January, uh, is along with, with what we were talking, Jack, what you were talking about, is serving mm -hmm. items outside for carry out and delivery that you couldn't get in the theater. Oh. You know, you're eating in the dark. You got to, you know, stay away from fork and knife in the theater, but how could we create something uh, that travels well, that you're known for, that you, is unique and different, but still be able to execute it out of the kitchen. So, is that Ghost Kitchen? Is that Alamo branded or does it carry another name? Uh, it carried another name. Uh, ironically, our, our CEO and founder, Tim Lee, uh, is a very creative individual. So it was called Chicken Man. Uh, and it, it was about chicken. Um, I love and it was wings. It was tenders. It was party pans, the whole nine yards. Uh, we did minimal marketing behind it. Uh, but, you know, we saw some success with it. So it, it let us know that once we can get back to the new normal, there's an opportunity to do stuff like this uh, for company owned as well as our franchisees. And our franchisees are excited to jump on carry out right now too. Cause you know, uh, like we had talked about, we've opened 18 locations between company owned and franchise literally in the past seven days. So if we get sidetrack on this real quick, and this is for, for, for everybody, um, you know, if you think about ghost kitchens or, or virtual kitchens or dark kitchens or cloud kitchens or wh whatever name they go by, uh, you have a few different types. Like you have the type where some sort of a commissary, like a physical kitchen opens up and a brand operates out of there for delivery. And then you have the other ones where it's like an existing restaurant or a kitchen that's already operating as a brand. Um, doing either the same items or different items and then um, promoting a new brand name on a marketplace somewhere, which seems to be quite successful in, in a lot of cases. It feels to me like that's really the future of, you know, the way the industry grows is that sort of second type of virtual kitchen where it's essentially just a, a virtual listing in a way. Do you sort of see it that way? Do you think this is more of a short term COVID phenomenon or do you think we'll have essentially 50 million restaurants in the country versus the 700,000 that we have right now, but they're all just sort of virtual offshoots of what's already there. That's a great question. And I, it's interesting that you asked that because I just had a conference call this morning about it. We do have a virtual brand, um, uh, neighborhood wings out there right now. It's doing well. And I think it will only become better with the, the items that we're talking about. I do think given the popularity of third party, you will see this, right? We are oversaturated with locations. Yep. There will always be in dining restaurant. There always will be a need for that. But I do believe, especially in more urban markets, that you're going to have more ghost kitchens and virtual brands. We're working on both. And um, I only see that as a future possibility because restaurant growth is not going to be there this is the growth that you will see, in my opinion. So do you deploy a different team to sort of not just hatch, but you know, manage these virtual brands? Or are they managed by the same teams <laughs> with the main brand? I wish they had separate teams. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm a one man show right now. And uh, uh, it, it's 24 it's seven. Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter because if it's our kitchen, like it, a virtual brand, it's our kitchen. And it has to come from us. So it's not a big deal. It's just the same process. Yeah. So it, it does take more hours and more time. A, a ghost kitchen, if you're really doing a ghost kitchen where it's a, somebody else running it, yeah. then it's a different story. But they still have to have our recipe. So it's really, uh, it, 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 and if it's different equipment, like this ghost kitchen will be, because you're only limited on space, then it's going to require us to do the work because we do need to make sure that the recipes end in the same result. They may not be the same recipe, but they need to end in that same result. I have experience with that in Chili's when we did uh, Kitchen of the Future, where we replaced all our equipment with Impingers and CTX, right? So uh, I think 
the technology has come a long way. It continues to increase, which is fantastic. Um, we're not 100% bright, but we'll get there. And I do believe, I mean, I'm somebody who orders DoorDash and Uber Eats all the time because I don't feel like cooking, right? I mean, you guys know, you're chefs all the time. And the last thing on a Friday night, I feel like I don't necessarily want to cook, so, but I want good food. And so I will order this. And I do think that is the way of the future. I think it's only grown and it will continue to grow. Uh, and I don't see us expanding big footprint restaurants, right? We already are oversaturated. So in my belief, I see this as a future uh, and a way to move forward. Yeah. So there really is an interesting dynamic here. I mean, Steve and Jeff, you both have virtual brands and neither one of your virtual brands references your actual brand, which is, I assume, by design. It seems to be the way most companies are doing it. It says something about what is the value of the master brand if we're not leveraging it. Right. I mean, how do we think about that in terms of the way we think about branding these virtual ideas? I mean, for us internally, the biggest thing we wanted to do is, you know, being being in the industry, the movie industry, we make our money off food and beverage. So we said, OK, how can we continue to increase revenue on the F&B side without, you know, taking price, taking price? Uh, it comes to a point where you're going to price yourself out of the market. And we're not I pick. We, we don't want to be I pick. We don't want to be that upper echelon. Uh, when it comes to the price point of what our guests expect. So as we did it, you know, our, our first thoughts were, hey, let's stand out on our own and see what happens. Uh, ironically, what was unique about it is due to the fact that you're using the same address as Alamo, uh, but, you know, inside a lot of the locations, we have specialty bars. So, uh, you know, the ghost kitchen, we said, okay, go to, the, the location we're at, we call it, you know, 400 Rabbits, which is really a Mexican themed specialty bar. So go there. So when Uber Eats or DoorDash or Grubhub place the order, very confused from a driver's standpoint. It took a while. Yeah. Uh, because, like this is Alamo Draft House. This is not where I'm picking my food up from. Uh, you, you know, so we would get phone calls from the drivers halfway through saying, hey, where are you guys located? Am I at the right <laughs> spot? Uh, but, you know, once it started to take off, uh, you know, and Austin still is, much as it's growing, it's still a small community. Uh, there, there were no issues with it. Um, and, you know, to continue to increase revenue on the F&B side is really uh, the exciting part yeah. in addition to just movies. I've got a question, too, about this. So the virtual kitchen is so obviously running out of your own operations already. You know, there's a danger of the peak time that you've got to wait, you know, at your restaurant or you've got a full theater, Jeff. And you're getting hit with all these other orders, you know, uh, how do you deal with that? You know, unfortunately, we haven't experienced it yet. I think the nice thing about these tablets is you can put times in to pick up orders, uh, which is nice. You know, when we first started, uh, you, you, you know, ham breaded tenders, you know, a 50 piece ham breaded tender, we're saying, okay, we need 45 <laughs> minutes or so to get that done. And then, as we continued to work at it and do these party pans, you know, we, we padded it a little too much, uh, which we felt maybe distracted business. So we lowered our times and, you know, you saw more people order it, but from an execution standpoint, there weren't many issues. I think, you know, when, when you think of tentpole movies that come out, whether it's a Star Wars or something along those lines, you know, we're, we're going to have to look at it. You know, it's, it's going to put, uh, added pressure and depending on the size of the theater is really the way we look at it is each individual screen is really an individual restaurant. So if you've got eight or nine screens, you've got eight or nine small restaurants that are coming out of one kitchen. Then all of a sudden you add uh, this virtual kitchen as well and to go food. And it, uh, it it's amazing how much food is pumped out during certain times. Yeah, I mean, you should be able to do a time restricted Pop, virtual pop-up restaurant, right? Which is like, hey, it's only available for the day. It's only available from 2 to 5 p.m. or something and address your, your downtime with, with that. Yeah, and you can with these third-party apps. You yeah. just have to get the marketing behind it. Yep. So <laughs> is, is the goal with the, with the virtual brand to develop the brand into a, a real brand name or is it all about just having them exist for a little while then you go on to the next virtual brand and you just sort of re retire the one and go to the next one or... Are you actually trying to build a brand in the long run? For us, I can tell you it's all about incremental sales, right? 
So to address Kevin's question, right now with 50% occupancy, we have not yep. had an issue with filling those orders. Now, if we get back to 100%, there could be, very well be a possibility. We, we haven't experienced it, just like Jeff hasn't experienced it. But for us, we already have a large percentage of our guests ordering online and to go. What we want to do is get incremental guests. So our neighborhood wings pop up when someone's looking for, for wings, right? Not Applebee's. And so we're trying to gather more guests in with this virtual brand versus what we already have with Applebee's because we already have a huge amount uh, going on third party as well as off premise. So this is about something different. I know Chili's just launched their virtual brand and they uh, reported uh, sales, which was really good. So, you know, it's something different. It's something that they can't get at Applebee's and they won't be able to. So even if they go into the restaurant or ask or call up, they won't have those menu items available. It's only available on uh, the virtual brand. Do you think in the long run, let's say some of the larger footprint casual dining suburban locations that we might see some of the seats go away and the kitchens get larger to support more virtual brands operating out of that store? I do. I, I mean, honestly, it, it, if I was a betting man, I would lay money down to say that's the way of the future. I mean, if, if, if you just look at the population growth and people spending more time at home, yep. uh, not even during this COVID thing, right? I mean, it's, it, there's so free time that we have that it's valuable to spend it with your family. And I think more and more people are realizing it's better to do it at home than going out. Now, you will never substitute it. People always want to go out. Uh, but, you know, we have so much dining in the United States that I think it's taken this pandemic to right size it. And I do think that the future is in delivery and offsite. So uh, that's my belief. And I think you'll see more ghost kitchens in larger cities that don't even have seating, yep. that it's just takeout. Um, that's, that's my belief. And, and I would, like I said, I would, if I was a betting man, which I'm not, I would put money down that that's what we would do. Hey, I got a question for you, Jeff. So in your situation, talk a little bit about like how people were buying tickets today and they have to order the food in advance. But that brings up another question, too. So when you're ordering, OK, I'm coming to the movie. I can't get in until next week because it's sold out, you know, the 50 percent capacity. Um, and I order the food. How do you know when they get to the theater that you deliver it to their tables? I mean, is it something where they're scanned in when they get there and then you fire it? Or is it some? But first of all, let me talk to us about the whole ordering system that they have to do in advance now. Yeah, I mean, pre-COVID, it was... Uh... You, you know, we would have an ordering card. You'd write your order down on a piece of paper. Uh, a server would come pick it up, look it over real quick, give you a thumbs up, kind of that ninja style, and then go ring it into, uh, you, you know, the, the POS system. But as we really started to think of the business model, and, you know, once again, it's a movie theater. You've got other people there, um, you know, air conditioning, filters, all these other things that uh, two and a half hours sitting next to people that you don't know. So we said, okay, let, let's look at this and how can we, as a brand, focus on those, limiting those interactions with our guests. And really what, what we did is we said, okay, let's take a platform. Let's develop uh, an online ordering system. We had about 42 items on the menu. We're down to about 17. Um, you know, a lot of it was based off of labor and simplification, uh, more so than anything uh, for this phase zero, we're calling it rollout. So you order it online. So, you know, it's all reserved seating. So, you know, one of the things we would do is they've already paid for their food and everything ahead of time. Uh, and we have two different POS systems. We have a POS system for tickets and then we have a POS system for food and beverage. So what we ended up doing is uh, the server still rings in their food when they arrive. So it doesn't disrupt the kitchen. The biggest thing is we didn't want to disrupt what we were doing in the kitchen because we're saying to ourselves is, you know, yes, the evolution of what we're doing is changing, but let's try and keep it as normal as possible for individuals that aren't in front of the guests. So it doesn't completely change our business model. Um, but we've written down every guest order. And as they sit down, their orders there to double check it, to make sure that 
they're sitting in the right seat. They've got the order. Uh, and then everything we're doing right now is in to-go packaging. Um, so as you're walking through a theater, you know, it, it's dark. Uh, when you're watching a movie, at least from a, a restaurant standpoint, you can see the server walking through. But we wanted to make sure our guests felt as safe as possible. So everything is in to-go boxes, so on and so forth. Um, so they're, as it gets dropped off, it's just one more of those safety measures that were taken uh, to make our guests feel comfortable uh, when they're in the theater. All right. So I come to see Tenet and it's an exciting movie and I'm going, well, I only like budgeted for two beers when I ordered this a week and a half ago, but now I want six. <laughs> what do I do? Yeah, you, you know what? That's, it, those are things that we're learning right now. Um, you know, we've got about four different business models. Uh, one is strict adherence to only doing that pre-order online. We've got franchisees that are doing a hybrid so they're still taking orders. You can still get additional items as you're there. It's incremental sales, you know. So what, what we're learning right now, and once again, is just listening to our guest feedback, that, that's a common problem. Um, and we're adamant right now that we're not doing any transactions during the theater. Uh, we're trying to make that guest feel as comfortable as possible. You know, Tenet was really the big movie for us to say, is the industry literally on a downward spiral, spiral, or is there an opportunity to slowly but surely get back to cinema and cinematic movies and not video on demand, uh, you know, 18, 24, 36 months down the road. So uh, we're, we're constantly pivoting. We're having conversations on a daily basis of really what, what that next step is. When are we going to implement uh, being able to get an extra beer? Uh, if a guest wants dessert and they didn't order it, you know, giving them that opportunity to do it. It may be cashless, but somehow or another, focusing on that is really our next step. You know, there's, it's actually, there's going to be a new piece of data that emerges from this that I don't think you could have gotten before, which is now you'll know what things people drink depending on which movie they see. I don't think you would have been able to capture that previously, right? So we, well, per genre, we do, uh, which is really interesting. So, you know, it's, it's so different than a restaurant because, you know, depending on the movie, you know, if it's a, a chick flick, you're selling a lot more salads uh, and a lot lighter food. If it's an action packed movie, it's, it's burgers, it's pizza. Um, if it's a kid's movie, you're selling no protein. Um, you're selling, you know, pizza, cheese pizza, so on and so forth. Um, so it's really interesting is we've got a pretty good breakdown based off of genre, how to order. Uh, you know, once again, is we're 90% we're scratch. So, you know, we're, we're cooking to order. We don't hold anything. So, you know, trying to make it, uh, you know, tr there's a method to the madness. But if, if you're not in the industry, it's difficult. The same thing with cocktails. Uh, you know, depending on the movie, is it more draft beer? Is it more, you know, cocktails, you know, and, and we'll go after that with movies. Uh, you know, Kingsman was supposed to come out uh, yeah. this fall. They got pushed. But we, uh, you know, we've had great success where we've partnered with different uh, liquor companies and uh, different drinks with them, knowing that based off of the movie, they guess they're going to order that drink. Well, they may not if they're going to go to a regular bar, but because it's, curated for that movie uh we've had great success with it so two questions for you number one this this personal curiosity number one what you just said about you know more salads the chick flick more burgers and whatnot at the action movie is that a hundred percent because of who's seeing the movie or is there something about the movie itself that puts you in the mood for a certain type of food like i'm gonna go see an action movie i'm gonna eat a burger damn it you know is there an aspect of that or is it just about the person I think it's a little of both. It's, it's interesting because when it is quote unquote, a love story or something along those lines and, and it's a Thursday or Friday and it's a date night and you see him walking in, um, you'll notice ironically that the guy may not order as heavy as if he's with his buddies, uh, where you're, you're starting out with chips and queso or fried pickles yeah. or something along those lines where it may be avocado toast because your <laughs> date or your wife likes it and you'll share it. Uh, and, and as you go through it, and that's the unique thing about, uh, you know, the challenges and in, in what excites me a lot of times with work is trying to, you're trying to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, and, and really sometimes you can't figure it out, but 
you know where it's going to skew uh, when it comes to what a guest is going to order. Okay, so question number two is, do you engineer your menu items so that they're not allowed to eat during a movie? We do. Uh, we try to. Uh, ironically, chips and queso, you know, you're crunching on chips. And yeah. it, it's funny is when I talk to individuals, they're like, you, we get guest complaints. You know, someone's watching a movie and someone's eating chips and queso. Uh, and you can hear the chip. And ironically, I, I don't order it a lot when I see the movies, but every once in a while I will just uh, to make sure it's up to, you know, to the brand standards. And when it gets quiet, you catch yourself. You won't eat that chip. Yeah. You'll wait. Uh, and ironically, my wife will look at me. She's like, you're not chewing. But yeah, we do. We try and stay away from fork and knife at all possible. We had actually launched a menu uh, and we were mushrooming it out at the beginning of the year. We had tested it when we opened our LA location last summer and we really tried to stay away from fork and knife uh, and, and make it much more handheld. We did a lot of research and we're saying, okay, how can we make this work to our guests? Still big, bold flavors because you're eating in the dark. So you lose that sense of visual. So if that first bite doesn't wow you, you'll finish the dish, but you may not order it again. So it, it's really handheld, not messy. Um, and, and, you know, going down that road, we still have salads, but, you know, they're for the most part, less than, you know, 6% of our pea mix for the most, you know, but it's, it's that healthy alternative. Yeah. I think your, your chip example is perfect because I found myself doing that. I actually ended up doing the, the single worst thing, which is you bite into the chip, and as soon as you bite in, you realize how loud it's going to be in, like, a quiet scene. And my instinct, which is the wrong instinct, is just bite into it real slowly at that point, which makes it 100 times worse because now you have 30 drawn-out seconds of cracking versus just one quick crunch. Then you get the strategy where you just maybe leave the chip in your mouth and hopefully get soggy enough from all your saliva <laughs> that you can just get into it when it's mushy. Uh, but it's, I always wondered, do you actually design your food that way? And I guess you do. That's great. To know. We do for the most part, you know, even, even when we're, we're curating features based off of movies is we really try and focus uh, on that as well. Uh, and when we do have tastings for uh, the executive team, we'll actually do them in a theater and we'll dim the lights. We won't show the movie, but we want to make sure that they get that experience when it comes to the food, because all of a sudden, you know, they'll tear it apart. They're picking at it. Uh, if you're doing it uh, underneath in, you know, our specialty bar where we do a lot of our tastings. So and does Alma do any of those 4D movies where they have like, you know, smells and like wind and like water that blows in your face? Nope, not yet. Not is yet. But we, I mean, we're, it, it's interesting is, is what's really unique is, you know, uh, we've got a new CEO, but our, but our founder is, is, so creative and has such abstract thinking on what he's doing uh, and what he wants to do. We're looking at, at as we start to reopen and looking at different spaces, you know, going into urban areas, do we do a micro screen that seats 10 people or less? Uh, you know, we started doing private rentals, uh, during COVID, you know, 30 people or less, you get to pick a movie uh, out of about 50 different movies from a repertoire. Uh, it's 150 bucks for the, for the rental of the theater. You buy your tickets and then you have to spend X amount of money on food and beverage. So, you know, that, and, you know, we thought as we started this and we're going on about six, five to six weeks with it at four different locations, we thought, okay, if we do 20 or 30, you know, we're in a good spot. We've done over 400 private rentals uh, in the past five weeks to the point wow. that we've actually had to turn rentals away because like tenant, you know, we're showing tenant and, you know, we want to make sure as a first run, we get it out there. So then we're saying to ourselves is, do we start to take first run movies and do you increase the rental but once with COVID, you know, if you can come in with 20 of your friends and watch a movie and you don't have to worry about strangers being in there, uh, it's that you just feel more comfortable with it. So, uh, going down that road, but he's adamant about creating little 10 seaters uh, and dropping it into a place and doing first run movies and whether it's partnering with the restaurant or somehow or another uh, taking our current menu and reducing it, uh, but make it that unique experience with food, beverage, and that cinematic experience. 10, ten seaters that are privately rented out, not you and eight other strangers or anything. 
private Correct. For, yeah. Yeah. What, so what you do is you, you'll, you'll pick it, you'll pick your movie, then you'll get a link. And then you send that link to your friends or family members, so on and so forth. They go in and that link ties directly to that movie. So oh. it's, there's no strangers involved. So it's kind of cool. That's a yeah, yeah, the companies have it. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you can, that, you can say, all right, so you could do something where the menu ties into the movie and it's got whatever. It's got Vuv and, you know, uh, champagne related items and whatever. And, you know, just, you know, to change, just keep bumping it up, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that really could be the evolution when it does, you know, that what's nice about what we do and what really separates us from the other major brands is we curate food based off of movies. So when a movie comes out, we'll get a, you know, we'll get a link, we'll pre-see the movie. Uh, and before COVID, you know, I had two different R&D chefs. I had one for the core menu and one that was creative. And all the creative one did was watch movies and come up with food. And I had a director of beverage that would do the same thing. And, you know, we would do something called a feast and we would take a movie and we would create a menu based off that movie like a beer or wine dinner you do in a restaurant. But what's unique about it is if there's a scene where someone's eating the, a dish, we'll recreate that dish and drop it at the exact same time that it's going off in the movie. So you're really creating this unique wow. experience. Uh, and that's what really separates us from Studio Movie Grill, iPick, and, and these, you know, Harkins, these other brands, uh, is we really focus on creating food based off of movies. That is so awesome. So... I always thought it was probably like the studio saying, hey, you should, you know, make this or it's, you know, very commercial. But it's actually you as a chef coming up with the dishes after just watching the movie. Is that correct? That's amazing. Uh, it's what the team would do. And, and what's unique is that you think of the big sick, uh, Kumal. So we actually partnered, yeah. my R&D chef partnered with Kumal. They talked on the phone five, six, seven times. And the menu we curated for that movie, he was doing his, his you know, traveling, and it, he was in the DFW area. He didn't get down to Austin, but, uh, you know, my chef went up there, and there's an interview with him. They sat together, uh, and, you know, he, he was blown away uh, with the food that we created. He gave a lot of his opinions, and it really studios now, seeing what we're doing and seeing how we attract uh, – additional guests for it they end up you know giving us some marketing money behind it where they're covering the the cost of the menus or you know if if there's giveaways and little chotskis that are done during that movie uh they'll partner with us and they'll take care of all of that very similar to to bill and ted's uh you know the most recent movie is we actually you know showed it in our theaters before it went live uh to video on demand that is so cool. It is. Well, hey, we're getting to that time. Let's just ask, is there something else you guys want to share? I mean, we've hit a lot of the topics that we have discussed here um, yesterday and, and felt like we wanted to talk about it. And even more, Jack, thanks so much for your questions. They were spot on here. Um, anything else you guys want to bring up before we close out? I think I'm good, uh, unless there's any questions other than what we've talked about. Yeah, I think that um, I, I think you guys really hit all the you know the points that we were looking for, and uh, what's unique about both of the you know brands that you represent. Um, that's been inspiring, and again, thanks to all the people I know. Some of them are on now that have been in some of our past webinars for the last ten. But we're looking forward to the next generation starting in two weeks, and uh, Jack will be with us as well. But uh, thanks to everyone for being here. Again, uh, the next one will be on the 16th of September, and uh, it's going to be uh, totally different. A little demo, a little action, a little drinking. I'm trying to find a way to get bourbon in all your households so we can <laughs> do something, a tasting along with it. Let me work on that one. So anyway, thanks. You guys have a great Labor Day weekend, and uh, we'll see you soon.